Listener discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to True Crime, the podcast that helps you find new, emerging, and undiscovered true crime podcasts. I'm Greg, the host and curator of True Crime. Today's episode is from Hands Off My Podcast, True Crime. Hands Off My Podcast, True Crime is an ethical true crime podcast empowering the vulnerable and making them heard. No longer voiceless, no longer forgotten. If you liked today's episode, make sure to check out the episode description for links to subscribe. All right, let's get this show started. Begin. Hands Off My Podcast is a proud member of Dark Cast Network, presenting the brightest of indie podcasts. Hola, my beautiful humans. This is Jasmine Castillo, and I bring stories and cases from the people of color community bringing awareness of murdered and missing indigenous women, girls, two spirits, the LGBTQ community, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, Black indigenous people of color. These are their stories. So welcome to Hands Off, my podcast. In this episode, we will be discussing the mysterious disappearance of Bianca Zanette Carrasco a 29-year-old nurse and mother of three. Bianca was last seen on May 1st, 2016 at her home in San Antonio, Texas. Bianca was determined to start fresh and even purchase a new phone that her husband could not access. She was also dating a new man, symbolizing her commitment to moving forward. However, despite her efforts, Bianca disappeared without a trace. Her car was found at their home, and there have been no signs of activity on her new phone or credit card since that faithful day. This is Bianca's story. Today I had the honor of speaking with Bianca's sister Giovanna and her close friend Rosa. They will show their personal experiences and the tireless efforts they have made to find Bianca. We hope that by discussing her case, we can raise awareness and potentially gather new information that could help solve the mystery surrounding her disappearance. Bianca Zanette Carrasco was a remarkable woman who had faced various challenges throughout her life. Despite the difficulties she encountered, Bianca managed to become a dedicated nurse and a loving mother of three children. At just 17 years old, Bianca made the heart-wrenching decision. We didn't grow up like it was an easy childhood, you know. Um, Bianca grew up with our, like we grew up with our mother. I think she was in third grade, second, third grade. So that would be what? Um, like nine, eight, yeah, eight or nine years old. Um, our mother sent her to our biological father. And I mean, I ended up following a little bit after, but, and after that, it, it's just, it wasn't a really easy, it's never been easy for, for us childhood wise. She, when we got into teenage, teenage years, um, starts to get really hard, just trying to cope with everything she got a little bit rebellious and I say a little bit she got rebellious and you know she she actually has a a baby or she's not a baby anymore she's she's a big girl now but our father made her give a baby up for adoption right when she was turning 17 so there's a lot of stories within that big story but it's just a lot Mm -hmm. I know what is it Rosa if you can help like because I yeah, I've I've shared a lot with Rosa. I've been really open. And I know Bianca has too. Um, whenever you come from like rough backgrounds, it's it's not like you don't know where to start. It's you know, it's just hard to talk about. It's hard for me to talk about it. And yeah. it was in a situation that I went through, but you know, being her friend and her telling me, you know, about everything in her past and opening up about it especially the topic of the baby that you know or her daughter that she had to give up for adoption like that that was really 
really hard for her to talk about, for her to deal with. Up until, you know, but yeah, like up until the, the week before she went missing. Yeah, because yeah, see, I went to go visit her in March, um, two months before she went missing. I was down there for spring break with her. And I mean, you know, she was telling me stories about her then. And in it, you know, because she, of course, now, how did she, what did she turn 18 this year, Giovanna? I think she just 19. turned 19. Yeah. 19. Yeah. 19. Mm-hmm. The 1st of July. So, I mean, just her being, getting older, getting to an age to where she, she wanted to have that opportunity to reach out. To let her know, like, you know, who she is, how she can contact her. She wanted that relationship. So that that was a tough conversation to deal with. You know, it was a hard topic for her, mm-hmm. which I felt like had a lot to do with life in general for her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Soon after, she entered into marriage with Daniel a man over 10 years older than her and also her aunt's ex-husband. Together, they had two children right away and later welcomed a third when Bianca turned 25. Again, why I wanted to have Rosa on this one is that for me, and maybe this will help you in the interview, is that um, obviously it's been seven years and she is still no trace, no nothing. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's a lot of judgment, a lot of stories, speculations, all these things. And for me in the beginning when she went missing, it was really hard because you don't know what to say or what not to say. Um, And you're looking out for, you know, you don't want to hurt people saying things or even hurting her. You want to, you know, I wanted to protect her, but it's gotten to the point where it's like, you know, I, I don't know what God's will is in this. But what I do know is that she still has a story to tell. Um, There's still a lot of things leading up to her disappearance that if we can share who she was, why she was that way, the beautiful things that she overcome and the things that she accomplished, that it really could help other people um, and really show empathy you know, show examples of ways to be empathetic, you know. Bianca completed her education at Odessa College and graduated from the Galen College of Nursing in October of 2015. She had been working as a registered nurse at an oncologist office. Following her graduation, Bianca made the decision to end her marriage and immediately updated her Facebook profile to reflect this change. How would you describe Bianca's personality? Hilarious. Yeah. Um, so funny. Yes. Funny. Sassy. Yeah, she was blunt, but like she was also very, I think from my perspective, because I'm the bigger sister, like she, it's like she, she would say these things, you know, that she was, she was like blunt, but it was like, she was also so enduring and nurturing and and sweet all at the same time. Like she was super compassionate. And so she would tell her close people exactly what she was thinking, you know, and mm-hmm. then you would be <laughs> caught off guard mm-hmm. with what she was saying. Um, but then she was she was so loving. She was such a loving person. My favorite thing that she would always tell me is like, you better pump your brakes. And that's how you knew like she was serious. <laughs> like, don't go there no more. Yeah. <laughs> but it was always laughing, you know, especially like with our kids. Cause our, our kids were somewhat close in age so watching them you know be together we'd laugh we you know play with the kids everybody loved music dance so that's what our kids would do you know and 
So it was just fun. Everything about Bianca was fun. And for us, we had just, we just had more history because she was my sister. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, at any point we could like, which this is why I love Rosa is that I can talk to her for hours, you know, about life. Um, Um, And it was the same with Bianca that I could just talk to her for hours. Um, And it wasn't, it was all kinds of different things and deep things. Um, And then when we say she's hilarious, it was like a, it was, oh, she was like morbidly funny. So it was, we always Mm -hmm. like make the joke. It was like, it was from our traumatic childhood, but it was comforting, you know? Like, it's just makes it a little bit. And Bianca was, Oh, but she made it like so like Bianca, don't joke like that, please. It was mm-hmm. so bad. And I'm telling you, it was it was so bad that that Friday be prepared what I'm about to say. That Friday before she went missing, she made the made the joke to her coworkers and said, Hey, if I go missing, you know what happened to me. Mm. And she probably meant it in a way, but she, but, then, but mm-hmm. she, that's how she joked. Like yeah, she mm-hmm. put a smile on her face or she was trying to, she would like cry sometimes and then she would like laugh, like just trying to, you know, like, mm-hmm. grasp the situation that's ahead of her possibly. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I know like the joke that I make now is like I know there is no way like all the crying I've done since she's been missing she would not be okay with at all because oh, definitely she, like I was the big sister and it was like if somebody made me cry um no like then she knew something was up you're not gonna make my big sister cry because she's the big sister and if you made her cry that means you did something really bad and I'm not okay with that you know yeah she was very loyal and very protective over the people that she loved that's when I feel like that's when her nursing came in yeah because she was so protective and caring and I mean something hurt like I I, I don't even think I went to the doctor having Bianca like (laughs) I would just call Bianca and tell her and she was definitely my go-to nurse for everything. Everything scrapes, anything. Which is why it's kind of hard. I went, I don't know, like I I became a grandma at a very young age. My baby's young. And I told Giovanna, like, I think that's why it was so hard for me dealing with the situation like I literally went through a really bad depression because I felt like the one person that I needed I didn't have I couldn't go to her for my questions and my because I know she would have made it okay from the get-go because she would have been like Rosa like stop it like this is happening for a reason and you know, she she would get real aggressive when she wanted to get through to you. Like, no, like, you're not going to, you know, like, as much as I could hear her saying it, it still wasn't easy. It was hard. It was hard to deal with. But, I mean, I'm so thankful for Giovanna because I feel like I have a piece of my Bianca still with Giovanna. Mm-hmm. Like, she talks like Bianca. I feel like her and Bianca sound so much alike, especially when she laughs. Like they mm-hmm. love the same. Oh, I'm not gonna allow you to do podcasts with me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Well, I I believe Rosa is completely truthful in regards to, you know, having a piece of Bianca. It makes a a lot of sense to have that comfort in a situation like that. Um, thank you for sharing that story, Rosa.
everything is better in pink. Everything is better in pink, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. That was her color. Yeah. <laughs> mm hmm everything was pink and then um she like rosa you you sent me a text like, for us to reply but it was zane but we had certain songs that always reminded each other of each other just mm -hmm. like from growing up or like it's so silly it's silly remember um oh, what was it? la diferencia mm -hmm. that group la diferencia mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. one of their whole albums like and we we don't speak spanish that's the funny part <laughs> that's the funny part but growing up like we were like we always remembered like it together and so there were certain songs like that and you know sh she was so funny she was really funny so. mine is uh what makes you um beautiful from one direction do you remember that one um that part yeah. when it's like you're insecure don't know what for and like the flip the hair like she flip her hair <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we talked about too when i was down there for spring break she's like you have to come back in august to go with me to zane's concert zane. yeah. <laughs> she loves zane from one direction <laughs> yeah we have our own type of country music we yes. have our own kind of spanish music so the hano music is it's Spanish Texas music. It's no, not see. just Spanish music. And it's yeah, Texas Norteño, Norteño and Texas right. And then country, it's like it's not regular country, it's Texas country. Yes. So mm -hmm. like for me and like Bianca, it was like those old school Tejano music that you grew up with around your fam the family that you heard. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you, we wouldn't make jokes because we didn't understand what they were saying or the music. Like she just, she was funny because she would make like these dance moves just to. Like, <laughs> <but>. mm -hmm. <laughs> so. She did love to dance. Yes, I love. No, but when you put Norteño on, she'd be like. Eh, 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 eh. <laughs> The cumbia, the, chi the chicken dance, the chicken dance. Yeah, that's what she said. <laughs> and she'd be like, "It sounds like you have to do the chicken dance." That's yeah, good. yes. She loved to dance. She really did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm the same way. I love to dance. I don't see anything. <laughs> it's funny. We'd, we'd, we'd be in the car, me and Bianca, and we'd be dancing. I'm telling you, especially to the One Direction. <laughs> oh. Funny. That, that was our jam. As time went on, Bianca started branching out and making new friends outside of the life with Daniel. The strain in their relationship led to discussions of divorce. On May 1st, 2016, during an afternoon conversation with her sister Giovanna, Bianca expressed her determination to seek legal advice with hopes of gaining custody of her children. I think about like when she got pregnant in high school, like that was so shocking to me because we were so close um, and I had no idea like what she was doing, like skipping school and all that. Um, I had no idea. Um, and then if Bianca was going to do something, whether good or bad, she was going to do it. That's it. There was no, like, if you found out about it or whatever, you know, I think she knew her people. She knew who would tell her what. Me and Rosa have talked about this. Like, she was private. And that comes, too, from our, like, our childhood. Like, we, mm -hmm. were, we were made to put on this face that everything is okay. Everything's perfect. There's nothing going on. And we learned how to do that very well. And I honestly believe that's why there was a lot, you know, there's things that people don't know or things that I found out or like things from the past, like different seasons of her life, people don't know. Um, and that that's not her fault. Like that's what we were taught. You're listening to Hands Off My Podcast, True Crime on True Crime by Indie Dropin.
we're going to take a quick break. And now back to this episode of Hands Off My Podcast, True Crime. Definitely. I can definitely say that. She she picked and chose what she wanted to share, you know, like. What she was comfortable was stuff, with sharing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What she was comfortable is exactly what I was, I was telling Giovanna the other day is I felt like, you know, because others know other things that, you know, we didn't know. And then we know things that others don't know. And, and you know, and like I told Giovanna, like, I feel like she picked and chose who she was comfortable in that situation with. You know, not not that anybody is better than anybody. It's just where she felt more comfortable at. And I feel like me and Giovanna, you know, Giovanna being her bigger sister and then me being the person that she knew who I was, I worried. I, you know, anything, you know, the kids were sick or she was sick. I was there calling. I was checking. You know, she knew the worry person that I was. So I feel like a bunch of this stuff that I didn't know is for that reason. She wasn't trying to worry me. She knew I had a lot going on in my own life that she, I know she just didn't want to worry me on certain things. So and that's another Joanna thing. says it was a big part. Yeah. And there, that's another thing too. Whenever you come from where we come from, you don't want to burden people with like your mm-hmm. issues. It, and it is, it may not be a burden for your friends or family, but it feels that way. It feels that way. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She had an argument with her husband, Joel Daniel Carrasco, before she left home on foot, leaving their two other children behind. This incident took place in the 16,000 block of Walnut Creek Drive. Now, we understand that tensions were high in this relationship, with their family mentioning previous difficulties and attempts to isolate Bianca from them. Bianca went missing just three days after posting an image on her Facebook account. It is important to note that it is completely out of character for Bianca to turn off her phone, something she has never done since May 1st at 10.22 p.m., the day she went missing. I think this is the difference, um, and I know that I've talked to Rosa about this. It's not the same as losing as losing a loved one. Right, it's not the right. same. Exactly. It's not the same. Yeah. Uh, it's you don't have the closure. You don't know. And the most hardest thing to say Uh, knowing my sister who she is what she would do or wouldn't do I don't want I don't want her to show up at my door like I don't want a police officer saying we found your sister because that would have that would have meant for seven years that she was being held against her will and I'm not okay with that like I don't I don't even want like that makes me sick to my stomach thinking about because I know my sister didn't just walk away I know she did it's a very real thing it's very different than there are people that just walk away Mm -hmm. there are people that are just missing but for Bianca something happened to her people know what happened to her and they're not speaking up and I, I can't like I, for se- I, for seven years, I cannot even. That crushes my heart to think about the possibility right. of even her, of her being alive because that would mean something very bad has been happening to her happening. for seven years. Right. I think the the way I would answer that is not what I would do if she was to come. My thing is, is what I would have changed the last time I saw her is what I feel like beats me up the most. You know, like maybe ask more questions, like, because I knew something was going on, but I didn't know through her. I knew through Joe Daniel because Joe Daniel and my husband were really good friends. So I knew things were going on because of him. And leading to that is... I would have taken it back and been like, hey, let's talk. What's going on? Can I help in some way? You know, something like that. You know, like, I would have hugged her tighter. 
I would have reminded her that I love her. I know she knew that, but to where she felt like she could come and tell me like, Rosa, this is going on. This is happening. What do you think I should do? You know, something. But I feel like that's that's how I would answer that question. I would have done things differently. I wouldn't lose her. She's, you know, like she's missing. We can't find her. We don't have that peace. We don't have that closure. We don't, we don't know nothing. So it's different. It's different for, for us in that situation. I completely understand both angles. Giovanna Rosa, thank you so much because there's times where Okay, I'm gonna, I'm sorry. There is times where you have to like um I'm sorry. I hold my kids a little tighter. I hold, you know, having that mind thought, the mind process that we are as as siblings, as parents, um, you never know that's their last day you get to see that person. So, um, you know, it, it, it really affects me that you don't expect that to happen to anyone. You don't have, you don't expect anything the worst to happen, you know, or just for them just to disappear without a trace. And people are, and when you brought up brought up the, the the thing about people knowing Giovanna, knowing about her and and what had happened to her and her disappearance, that infuriates me even more to know that somebody knows something and they're not saying anything. And you know, I am so sorry um, that you're going through this. So. It's just, um, it's, it's totally, it, it's, it's, unless, unless you're in this situation like that, you'll never understand. Like, never. You'll never understand unless it, it literally happens to you, you know, um, Cause it's easy for everybody to say, you know, oh, well, you know, you lost her, you know, she's gone. Like, mm -hmm. no, you, you can't say that to us, you know? And, and I feel like that's why Giovanna and I have gotten so close because her hurt is my hurt, you know, her, Hers is uh, totally more. And like I tell her, I will never take the fact that you're her sister. I will never try to be better than you. I will never say like, oh, I miss her more or, oh, I loved her more. No, no, no. But I know, I know Giovanna hurts. And I, the same way I hurt, we can relate to that hurt. Exactly. For me, it took... I mean, I don't know. Julie set these con these podcasts up, but it's not easy. It's not easy to talk about because it does bring up all those things. It does. Like she got to this place for a reason. It's not just like she didn't like you said. You're She didn't survive. You know. So there's more to to that story yes and it takes a lot for the family to actually speak up about things things that i told my mom today i mean she's in prison and you know she's crying and just my whole family on both sides may hate me by the time this is all said and done because nobody wants to talk about these really hard things but 
Bianca's not here, and there's many reasons that led up to to this. Right. She was very young still at the time that she disappeared. So, I'm sorry if I come across. Uh, I just it took me a lot to get here to actually start speaking up and speaking out. So, yeah, you know. her voice. Never apologize. Her voice. Ever, ever, never apologize, Giovanna, because you are doing something that your sister would have done. I think that's a exactly. lot of things of the perspective that a lot of people don't understand is that you are her voice when she is absent. Um, so don't ever apologize for what you do. Don't ever apologize because you're doing it with strength and you're doing it with courage. You're in a in a step where a lot of other families have even gotten to and it's been 20 years. It's something that the family knows and they're hush about it because it's some kind of like unwritten rule that they don't let other people into their lives. We'll deal with our own family issues and not have anyone else be involved in their lost loved ones story. So this is a huge step. Don't ever apologize. But I'm glad that you are here to tell Bianca's story. The media takes things and then they just go and then you I think the last two podcasts that I did it was more of um I just want to I just want to find her. Right. I just want people to know how it got here and I want I say I want I, I pray that someone somewhere has the conviction to to hear things out loud and say I need to say something that's why I'm doing these podcasts yes because it's not like I feel like what I've heard from Giovanna and I and I feel like I feel the same way too is that is we want people to know Bianca who Bianca is what you know the person she was she wasn't just somebody who married her uncle and went missing because that's what everything out there is making itself Mm -hmm. you know and that's what she means by there's a story behind it all it's not just she married her uncle right and that was one of the things that i wanted to completely debunk or have your the story to the truthfulness of the story because i noticed that a lot that it was always like the centerpiece of conversations and i completely agree with y'all that that's not what defines the situation the, the, the it could be joe schmo from mars and that shouldn't that sh- should have never happened to her no matter who was involved in her life so in regard but i know that you want to get the record straight in regards to how what had led up her story behind it because i don't like to listen to media i don't like to feed into all of that because that's not coming from you i don't see it as genuine i see it as a attention seeking looking for subs trying to get cl- clout in their whatever and initially that one story was released and that's everyone focused on that right everybody went with that mm-hmm. which it is part of the problem like it's a little piece of the problem but there was a very short journey there for Bianca I mean I'll start off with, because I've said this multiple times in other interviews, is that our mother is in prison, okay? And our father's nowhere involved trying to find her. So that off the top 
should give you some kind of clue. There's some pretty crazy things going on there, right? But I can give you all these little details and tell you that we're with our dad. There's. It was rough. Yeah, it was rough. rough childhood like rough and she got pregnant at 16 that baby was born July 1st she was turning 17 July 21st she was sent away when she got pregnant when that happened she didn't give up this baby on her good like she didn't yeah she didn't it wasn't that it wasn't we didn't we did not have the family support so she does that gives the baby up, finishes high school, goes and tries to find our mother, who is at that point already a felon, already in and out, doing things she shouldn't be doing. Within a short amount of time, this family, like our our mother's side of the family, we didn't grow up with them. Our dad had kept us away. We didn't So this uncle, like he wasn't, we didn't look at him like that because we didn't grow up with our family like that. We still, I still don't know my mother's side of the family very well. And then within a year, a year, within a year, she gets mixed up with Joe Daniel and gets pregnant with my oldest niece. You're talking a year. So the most vulnerable, darkest, lonely, nobody there. I mean, I followed her to Odessa, but I'm I'm we're only 18 months apart. And she's with this man who is much older than her. And and then it just goes on from there. So it's not it's not as simple as everyone makes it out to be that she married her uncle thank you thank you for setting that straight because that's I want the truthfulness I don't want this blown up exaggerated story that a lot of people are going with and I you know I've dealt with a lot of family members on my podcast that had the same scenario um, being blown out of proportion about the stories of their lost loved ones or their well it's to hide it's to hide all the other skeletons that everybody else has right that's what it is because and for me to to say that i'd have to say all these other things and so there's things that are going to come out there's things people are going to put two and two together and it's going to be it's not comfortable it's not doesn't make the families look good you know but she's missing like Somebody hurt her. She's gone. Her babies are without her. It doesn't matter. It's time to suck up your pride and and get over it. Um, I I feel like people who didn't get to know Bianca missed out. They missed out because... mm -hmm. They really did. If you needed something, she heard somebody need something, she was right there. Like, she, she was... Whatever. What do I need to do? How can I help you? That's how she was. Mm -hmm. And that says a lot, even coming from work. Like, that's why I want to share. Like, people wouldn't have been like her. They would have been mean. And she didn't. She, She tried to change her life and help people regardless of what she went through and how mean people were to her. That's what I told Giovanna the other day is is I feel like that's what made her her is because she she chose to be different. She chose to to take everything she went oh, through and put again. it into some mm-hmm. because I feel like nowadays especially the generation of today these kids use oh all their past trauma as excuses to why they don't do this they don't finish school they don't you know they turn to drugs they do this they do that and that's and that's that was with Bianca nope. like it made her strong 
it made uh, her hope her kids know that you know they learn that because I know she would want them to know the same thing to know to do the same thing mm-hmm. we love harder and there's always a reason why we love harder it's because yeah. we are trying to make up for the lost love that we didn't have in our childhood or the trauma that we are we had endured that we're trying to make it a constructive instead of destructive pattern in our lives um, overcompensating oh, yeah. for yeah. the lack of what we had received as a child so that's that's so and I feel like that's why she was the way she was with her kids mm-hmm. very protective of her kids it, you know she had to be really really close for you to be around them to watch them to take care like she nobody yeah. nobody took care of Bianca's kids that's why I wasn't buying what was happening towards the end. Mm-hmm. Wasn't buying it. Yeah. And that's how come when, you know, I found out through social media, I, I wasn't on Facebook, but I had actually gotten a message from one of our other friends asking me, I mean, like reaching out to me, telling me they were sorry that they had heard about Bianca. And I was like, what about Bianca? And she's like, you don't know? And I was like, no. And then she said, um, she's missing. I said, what do you mean she's missing? Like I had just talked to Bianca the night before. And that's when I get on Facebook. And, you know, when I call Joe Daniel. A few days prior to her disappearance, Bianca reached out to her sister via text stating that Daniel had emptied their account and opened a new one without her name on it. This left her with limited financial resources, only having access to a credit card that was close to its limit. Bianca expressed that she refused to be controlled by a man or money. The last conversation Bianca had with her sister, Giovanna, occurred at 2 p.m. on the day she went missing. During this conversation, she discussed plans to consult with a lawyer regarding child custody matters. Initially, Daniel did not want to report Bianca as a missing person because he believed she left willingly. However, due to the insistence of her sister, a report was eventually filed. So in the very beginning, the last pings for her phone were right there by her house and we, we did two searches. Um, one with like the community gathering and then Texas EchoSearch actually helped us search the area and they searched the home, they searched the cars, they had dogs. As far as the results, I'm not entirely sure that they came back clear. So yeah, that was the search efforts that other than that, we haven't, they will, haven't given us anywhere else to look. I mean, he left that night. Uh, San Antonio is five hours from Odessa where he drove. He didn't get back to San Antonio till eight o'clock Monday night. So you're listening to Hands Off My Podcast, True Crime on True Crime by Indie Drop-In. We're going to take a quick break. And now back to this episode of Hands Off My Podcast, True Crime. Only in the media, like... They have said that there could be foul play. They believe there's foul play. Um, I was told by a homicide detective that, unfortunately, if we don't find a body, there's nothing we can do. A homicide detective. CPS, I mean, CPS got involved the very first week, you know, because the kids were left and they were just gun home. I mean, that's why they removed the children was that they were convinced something happen but it's two different agencies I don't know it, it's super frustrating missing persons in Texas is very sad because there's a lot there's a lot of missings yes I've noticed that as I continue to do research about San Antonio um, mm-hmm. it's they very sad. are very loose in their investigative practices, if there's well, one any. Of, one of the major things is like their missing persons unit. 
they're not police officers, they're agents. So they only have so much authority in the first place. Other counties, you may have police officers and missing persons, but as far as San Antonio goes, they're not police officers. They're limited to what they can do. So then they have to determine who they can get help from, who to reach out to. Is it foul play? I mean, it's it's crazy. It's something needs to be changed for sure. Oh yeah, uh-huh. for sure, for sure. Mm-hmm. Oh, what part is that? Adults have rights. We can disappear if we want to. And it's so hard to prove if something is not right. And like the family members, like I knew something was wrong. You know, I could give you all these things and could tell you, no, she's not missing. Something happened to her. But then you have these laws that protect, but they don't really protect them. Because in a missing person's case, those first few hours are the most important. I feel like she wasn't taken as seriously like her case wasn't taken as seriously I've thought maybe and I don't know if this is just me feeling some type of way of is it because I'm just her sister my mom and dad are not there fighting for her and maybe they're saying like oh well if her parents don't care you know what I mean Uh Yeah. things like that I feel like I was naive and did the best that I could in the beginning. But yeah, you trust that 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 they're going to help when you're crying out and saying, hey, this is going on. I know this happened. I know this happened. Please go look into this or, you know. Mm-hmm. And and the, the hard part, too, is that not every individual in law law enforcement is like that Mm. you know so it's like there may be one person trying to do their job and they're doing their job correctly but they get a bad rap for all the ones who didn't for Mm -hmm. sure one Mm -hmm. one rotten apple spoils the bunch they say so they're looked upon as a whole and it's it's sad because I bet you that person is coming in with the intentions of trying to turn that negativity of that district or department around and it's just or one just do their job. yeah they're, yeah as long as I mean, just, in her case it was very simple it's like just do your job yeah yeah and, i and mean I there mean, are things that it's just like why why didn't you do that mm-hmm. yeah very careless mm-hmm. very careless yeah now her are they they're currently married correct and it's how is it you said joe daniel or is it just daniel or how how do you identify her partner his name is joe daniel but his nickname is daniel like that's what everyone calls him okay Mm -hmm. now has daniel been questioned by the sapd and what was the result of that they questioned him one time and then he and he cooperated for the the beginning they asked if he would take a polygraph test he initially said yes and then somewhere a little after that he got a lawyer and then no more no more questioning no more polygraph no cooperation did the SAPD do anything like the like at least a bare minimum of like looking at her at her last place where she was identified as last place seen? Did they do at least anything um, to, or if they had provided you any additional information about what they've done so far? Yeah, I mean, I think initially they. I mean, CPS got involved immediately. If you know anything about CPS in Texas, it takes a lot for them to remove the children. For them to be urgently removed in the way that they did, there was big, huge red flags for them to be able to do that. They did go into the home and they searched it and they did the whole spraying, the lights or 
my only my only concern is that what came up into those reports you know and i don't want to say too much because there is investigating going on reinvestigating going on now but like even questioning like how far did they go with the questioning i'm not sure you know and have they kept in contact with you in regards to any updates or has it been pretty much a one-way street that you've been reaching out to them about status updates one way yeah i figured that seems like it's a constant ammo when it comes to law enforcement um well especially with missing people yes yeah i mean i feel like seven seven years says a lot yeah Mm -hmm. for sure for sure has the FBI been involved in the investigation of her disappearance, Bianca's disappearance? Or have you requested her to, to them to be? Because I think that's a family request. I'm not sure no. what level the FBI no. is involved, but I'm not sure if no. that's... No. 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 Law enforcement has to request help. They can request help from the Rangers. Okay, Texas uh, Rangers, FBI, yeah. Yeah, okay. FBI can get involved if it's on government property. They can automatically get involved. Yeah. No. Really? We can't. I've called FBI before. You can't just go and request and say, hey, can you help me? That's not how it works. But have you looked into um, private investigating or other organizations? Or can you, are you able to share that or not at all? Yes. So Texas Equa Search is a nonprofit organization. They help huge big time in the state of texas and nationwide they helped us they help all these organizations can help as far as law enforcement whatever information they give them they can't have all the information public investigators the same it's all it all depends on what law enforcement is going to give them what information will they give them for them for them to further you know their own investigations Mm, i see i think there's a thing that um they don't want too many hands in the cookie jar so say or someone's tripping over each other's feet in regards to investigation i'm not sure if that plays in this part but i would think the more the merrier in regards to trying to connect the pieces i could see that because honestly with bianca's case they had too many departments involved, like within San Antonio Police Department. There were too many departments where they could never get the dots all together. So one department knew this, one department knew that. And so not, no one was e- ever able to see the big picture. So I, I could see how they would be more protective mm-hmm. across the board with that. And you did mention that there hasn't been any recent updates or developments in Bianca's disappearance. So far, you've been up to date in regards to what has been done so far. Have you, as a family, um, been involved in raising money and doing things from your side of the investigation or side of the searching for her? Um, have you done GoFundMe or raising money for rewarding or? Yeah, we have a GoFundMe and a Venmo. Um, it's been shared a lot, but not really donated to a lot. I'm not sure why, which I mean, it is what it is. We do. Tr- uh, one of her other f- Bianca's distance friends started up a new page and we've we've all been trying to get things going like different social media um, things just to get the word out, just to put more pressure on the police and just spreading the word. So if you go to her page, her help page, it's help find answers for Bianca Carrasco. And we've started, you know, just trying to get the Twitter, the Facebook, the Instagram, all this stuff restarted. In the very beginning, we had a help page, but it someone tried to hack into it and I never been able to get back into it yeah I was gonna ask you about that like what happened yeah, it was really weird yeah because yeah. mm-hmm. you did mention I, that a couple times on your new Facebook page that yeah I actually had to get a new Facebook my, yeah. my personal Facebook yeah oh, wow 
Mm -hmm. uh, people are just downright cruel. Like you see, <laughs> what's what's the worth of doing something like that to a page that's trying to look for a missing person? Like you have to be a lowest of the low in regards to doing something like that. I don't know the, but I just oh. I was trying to figure out like why. But I guess Facebook is just Facebook, so. Um, Why? Because whoever was doing it doesn't want other people to know. To know. Mm. That's why. I yeah, there has to be some reason, and that makes yeah. sense in regards to that. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. As far as I know, the um, house and the vehicles were searched. Again, I'm not sure of the results of those. Okay. She left. Well, he said she left on foot. On, on foot. foot. Okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, was and I, and I hate to say this because it seems like it's an ongoing saying that a lot of partners will identify that when someone goes missing, they left on foot with an unknown person to an with a to an unknown person. The person that was another man or does. Is that something you're able to share as a reason why he, his his story in regards to why she would leave on foot? I guess what the, it was the day that she went missing and kind of what led up to him identifying that she had left on foot. Um, can you tell me a little bit on her the day that was leading up to her disappearance? So, so they were um, they were not talking and they and then they were talking they were arguing those months leading up to her disappearance and she was talking to one person in particular he found out the week before she went missing and actually called that guy and so yeah that's what he says that she left with that guy but if you know my sisters I mean she don't have anything with her and she wouldn't have left her car it would it just doesn't make sense if you look at the case definitely wouldn't have left walking uh -uh. Yeah. Back, mean, back to the not no being an outdoor person <laughs> yeah there's so many quicker options of mm -hmm. fleeing from something that was a verbally abusive relationship and yeah. walking is probably like the last thing that's on the list if there's no other way of means especially of especially at 10 o'clock at night and that as well and being a woman at night on san antonio streets uh -huh. um would be like the big like the last end result of all their options are just obsolete yeah and every case is of a disappearance is always like nothing really adds up because it's always the reason why it's not adding up is because there's there's not the truth has not been identified there's there's a lot of hidden lies or lies that are being told about the person that's missing bianca that's missing to cover their own tracks of course it's never going to be oh yeah that makes sense you know that's never you never come to a conclusion where like oh yeah that makes sense like that never happens in a, in a disappearance of a person has she ever touched her banking account what what kind of leads you up to knowing that you know the walking away s statement doesn't add up like you said it doesn't it never adds up to why a person why Bianca had disappeared because um, there's nothing there's nothing. Yeah, she has no activity on her checking account. There's no activity on anything that she would have used by means of supporting and in helping herself along the way of her um, nope. walking away from her family, which I wholly, 100% doubt that she did it on her accord. And with Bianca, just understanding Bianca, that's something she would have never done. You know, and different circumstances. Her job too. She wouldn't have just not showed right. up to her job either. Exactly. There's not there. You can't just disappear like that now. Mm -hmm. And there's been nothing, absolutely nothing. Her phone was turned off that night. Never pinged again. Mm -hmm. Never pinged at the time that he made a phone call. Mm. 
that's not Mm -mm. yeah that's yeah Mm -mm. and what gets me more flustered is that when they're saying that there's not enough information or evidence to lead up to someone's indictment or conviction of her disappearance which is like a total piece of baloney because there's enough to put this whoever this perpetrator is in jail on indicted on her disappearance or whatever the case may be on why Bianca is not here it just floors me like what else what other information do you need to make it solidified that she is missing and that this person was behind her disappearance like what more do you what what more does a a SAPD need to do or need to see to move forward on that we need Bianca Mm -hmm. yeah and that's what I'm and I thank you for sharing this with me because it's been an honor speaking with you Giovanna and Rosa about a very special person that is currently missing Bianca Carrasco Bianca was last seen at her home in San Antonio, Texas, and her husband's involvement in her disappearance is uncertain. Despite the searches and investigations, few clues have emerged and no suspects or persons of interest have been identified. Bianca's loved ones are adamant that she would never leave her children willingly, making her disappearance highly concerning. Police are urging anyone with information about her whereabouts to contact them. I really Did appreciate you... you covering it and helping us get the word out. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank, thank you so you, much. You. You're very welcome, Rosa, Giovanna. I see you. Thank you so much for your time, and you have a good restful evening. You too. You too. Bianca Zanette Carrasco is described as a Hispanic woman with brown eyes and shoulder-length brown hair. She stands at 5 feet 1 inch and weighs 125 pounds. At the time of her disappearance, she was wearing a colorful pastel leggings, a blue jean jacket. Additionally, she has a surgical scar on her abdomen and the letter B tattooed on her hip. If you or anyone you know has any information about Bianca Zanette Carrasco, we urge you to contact the San Antonio Police Department at 210-207-7662. Your help could be instrumental in bringing closure to Bianca's loved ones and finding justice for her. We thank you for listening to Giovanna tell the story in the events leading up to Bianca's disappearance. Please share and help bring attention to cases like Bianca's ensuring that they are never forgotten. If you enjoy our show, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to come back for our discussion of true crime stories. Starting in June, I will be switching over the podcast to be a bi-weekly pod platform. Until then, this is Jasmine Castillo. We are voiceless no more. This podcast was created, produced, Recorded, researched, and edited by Jasmine Castillo, current active member of Dark Cast Network, Transto Task Force, Uncovered.com, and partners with Search and Support San Antonio. Thanks again for listening to True Crime by Indie Drop-In Network. If you would like to nominate a true crime podcast to be featured, just send me a tweet at Indie Drop-In. I'd also love to hear if one of our featured podcasts is now your favorite show. Indie Drop-In survives off ad revenue and listener donations. If you would like to contribute, please consider buying me a coffee. You can go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash Indie Drop-In. If you look at the very bottom of the episode description, I put a link in there to make it really easy. Indie Drop-In has many other shows that you also might like. Just go to IndieDropIn.com. All right, see you next week.